Welcome to the Somatic Coaching Academy podcast with Ani and Brian. Join us as we explore the art and science of trauma-sensitive somatic practices and tools to strengthen your practice as a coach, therapist, or holistic professional. Master the art of motivating even the most challenging clients when you'll understand how to tap into and unlock your client's complete holistic intelligence. If you want to learn the most cutting edge, research supported skills for personal and professional mastery, you've come to the right place. Let's get this conversation started. Hi, and welcome to the Somatic Coaching Academy podcast. Hey there, Brian. Hey, Ani. How's 41 treating you? 41 is feeling fine. We are on episode 41 today, and I've got to tell you, 40 hit me a little bit hard. Mm -hmm. Like 40 was kind of like a ton of bricks there, like 40. Little midlife midlife crisis. 40. There. We're 40. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was. It was... Uh, just a little jarring for me. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> but 41, I feel like I've got my feet That's on the good. ground now. Yeah. And uh, I really want to thank you if you've been listening to the podcast. Hey, especially mm -hmm. if you have listened to all 40 Ooh, episodes. Yeah. And thank you so much to those of you who share your comments with us, uh, especially in public so we can have conversation, right? Those of you who are sharing your ratings and your reviews and we're having conversations about these things on social media, we really, really appreciate you because it's um, it's so great to be able to have a conversation about these things and to hear your wisdom and insights and, of course, questions. So. Mm, yes. Yeah. 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 So today we're talking about wellness professionals mm, and yeah. how you can have better results. Yes. How can you get better results? By using somatic methods. Yeah. Last episode, we actually touched in on some of these, th this concept mm -hmm. of wellness. And it, wellness has really taken quite a transformational ride over the past whatever amount of years you were talking about the eighties. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, did people even say wellness in the eighties? <laughs> I don't, you know, they no, said, let's so. get <laughs> physical. <laughs> right, yeah, physical. Exactly. I mean, we talked about exercise, exercise, yeah, like that, exercise. That was, actually was like a the big primary deal, right? thing of wellness. Yeah. 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 But then it started at some point to turn more into like a wellness mm -hmm. kind of thing. And spirituality and health also started to, um, come together in some kind of <laughs> sense. I remember I'm, I'm laughing because I remember one of the people who was a foundational teacher for me, Carolyn Mace, who I've been reading about a long time, many years ago, maybe, maybe 15 years ago, I remember her saying publicly, when did this happen? That mm -hmm. spirituality and health, um, you know, became this part of the right, same conversation. Moves, yeah. Um, so wellness and preventative mm -hmm. and medicine and health and spirituality and body mind and all of these things really have matured and yeah or, or whatever. I don't know where we are in the you know, trajectory. Well, the funny thing is I was just listening to a report a couple of days ago about a huge study with 5 million people that has been done that has completely debunked the idea that alcohol has any protective effects for your health at all. <laughs> You remember? Oops. You remember in the '90s, <laughs> like there was that Morley Schaefer, like '60 Minutes episode where he yes. holds up a glass of wine and he's like, mm, "This is good." Has been shown to be good for your heart. Well, it turns out like that that science was completely um, erroneous. Like they had just had all this data and they had grouped some um, some of the people in the study inappropriately to make <laughs> it look like to make it look like that alcohol, wine especially, like actually helped your heart uh -huh. and. And so these researchers kind of over the last few decades have gone back and like looked at it and pretty much completely debunked uh -huh. the idea that alcohol is any protective at all. We might have if just anything, lost a few listeners. If anything, it's actually a bit deleterious for your health in, in any measure with increase in quantities. <laughs> so, but even, but it's what I'm saying kind of like is know even, that really. <laughs> even the alcohol industry was trying to get on the wellness bandwagon. <laughs> totally. That, that's what well, made Duncan, me think of that. Dunkin' right. Donuts, right? Yeah. Like they have like the runner man on their sign now. It's like, everybody's running on yeah, Dunkin'. Exactly, <laughs> like, yeah. We're healthy too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's nothing bad about a donut. You know, it's like just, there's nothing. It's, it's just, just funny, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. It's actually all, and it's not just, it's all the, you know, anyway, but it's just, everybody's looking to get on the wellness bandwagon yeah, now, yeah, right? Yeah. It's so funny that it's happening. That so way. we're poking a lot of fun, but it's also yeah. so totally awesome because people are 
way more interested in um, being healthy and, and being preventative. And mm -hmm. uh, people are way more willing to talk about all kinds of ways that that happens. And that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a fun time. It is fun. I mean, it, with that movement, right? It's just, and maybe it is emblematic that the movement is gaining speed when other characters who are, aren't so well are trying to promote themselves as being well mm -hmm. sort of thing, you know, cause like the winner as far as diet is like kale, like, like kale, 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 kale's got a pretty good marketing kale's campaign, increasing like, its marketing capabilities, yeah. but like, you know, kale and spinach and greens, like we know oh, those things are good. Okay. So hang on a second. Cause I was just talking about this with some friends. One of the reasons that I think vegetables were getting a nasty rap is because when I was growing up in the eighties, they were boiled. Bless my mom, <laughs> but everything it was, was boiled. boiled. Oh, it was just so everything bad. was boiled. So I was roasting some beets this up. Uh, a few days ago, and I was like, when did we discover that this was an okay method, <laughs> exactly. that it was way far superior yeah, exactly. than boiling, boiling all vegetables? Things. Right, I know. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. all of a sudden we started roasting things and we're like, yeah, I can yeah, eat I can kale, roast. I, can I, can eat, eat, I can eat some Brussels kale. Brussels sprouts. We have had some of the best roasted Brussels mm -hmm. sprouts oh, yeah. ever I'm, on the planet. I love just traveling to restaurants and like or, always ordering the Brussels sprouts. sprouts I got to try them everywhere. We're in. Yeah. And I remember, you know, growing up, there oh, was no way. So we've come a long way, mm -hmm. folks. Yeah. On <laughs> and what are we talking about? Anyway. <laughs> oh, we're talking about how wellness professionals can of, use some Yeah. Methods. And, and by the way, like. Wellness professionals are trying to help people to eat Brussels sprouts, mm, Brian, sure, yeah. and do things like get healthy and um, exercise and get better all. sleep. Absolutely. You know? There's so many different ways to use wellness now. And there's so right. many different wellness, so many different kinds of wellness professionals. And, uh, you know, um, let me finish my thought. And, and somatic practices, somatic work can help wellness professionals to get better yeah. Results. I do think that there, it's still a little bit of a shame that we don't expect better results in the wellness industry, to be perfectly honest with you, because there's still, and I, I can speak to this because I have been there and I am there. There's still this like okayness around the fact that only some people are going to get results because mm -hmm. not everybody's going to try hard enough and not everybody's going to do their homework and not everybody's going to fill in the blank on the the things that then we can blame get not getting awesome results on when the fact is we can actually make a bigger difference in more people's lives and get 100% results with 100% of people when we really know how to use somatics and specifically trauma sensitive somatics mm -hmm. within the context of the other changes that we're trying to help facilitate for for people 100% yeah, hundred um, percent. And and so let's just say that all, all the the focus on the exercise and the sleep and the diet it's critically important. Yeah, absolutely. right. It's so, so it's good. actually so important that when we think about working or uh, if someone's struggling with a, a mental health issue or a mental wellness issue, let's say that we know now that the Physical, physical body, the matters. gut biome, all those kinds of things massively affect our mental health. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is a bit frustrating for me sometimes when people are experiencing mental health challenges, mental wellness challenges, and they are seeking um, therapeutics for it, mm -hmm. nothing against those things, but they're not even eating broccoli. Right. Like they're eating like really highly processed foods, a lot of sugars, all those kinds of things, drinking alcohol and their gut biome, I'm sure is all, all whacked, whacked out, out. Yeah. and that's affecting their mental health. So, so wellness professionals, it's like, that's why it's so critical to help people like make those changes first because you don't have a prayer of helping anywhere above that. Yeah. If you absolutely do that work. and it can be really frustrating to be a wellness professional who is helping people to make these changes that we know are so massively important to their lives and we can't quote unquote get them to do it mm -hmm. um and uh so that's what we're really talking about uh today and one of the things i want to point out is in particular you know on this episode we're talking about helping people to make body changes yeah you know like that it can be really challenging. Right. It can be really challenging to do that. So wellness professionals, I mean, you're really focused on that. Like, amen. Like that's so super important. Yeah. And at the same time, um, it, it's not the end all and be all because a lot of the reasons people have 
as you point out, Ani, have trouble making those body changes is because there's something else standing in the way of them doing it. Well, an inner thing. I mean, if you just mm -hmm. think about it like this, if we're talking about food or we're talking about exercise, we're talking about our schedule, we're talking about our wellness routine, we're talking about self-care, whatever it is, that is like an, a change I want to make in the external environment. Mm -hmm. And when we really look at how somatic coaching can help you to make the internal change mm -hmm. that then allows a person right. to easily make the external change. And I'm bringing that up because coaching, uh, as we were talking about in the last episode, is a very broad range of how yeah. mm -hmm. coaches operate. And one of the things that draws people to somatic coaching in particular is the fact that there are a lot of coaching methodologies and um, ways in which to coach that are all about the external thing, helping people to be more productive, helping people to use their calendar, helping mm -hmm. people to change their diet and things like that. And those are all fantastic. And when paired with internal transformation, when paired with the somatic rewiring, reprogramming of the nervous system actually do create those sustainable changes. So it's the inside change that per allows the outside change to happen easily and sustainably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so one way we could talk about that inside stuff is kind of like our belief systems and our perceptions. Um, in uh, interesting in traditional Chinese medicine, there's a, a beautiful concept, uh, actually a kind of a framework within, within and itself, like the the um, they have this body level that people kind of work with, but then there's also what we call the heart mind level, heart mind. And um, I I'm not going to try to even pronounce it. Well, actually, I will. Xin Xin is kind of the word. If uh, I do not speak Chinese, I'm sure I just ruined that word for a lot of people. But that's the idea of heart mind. So in traditional Chinese medicine, there's no word for heart all by itself. And there's no word for mind all by itself. That the idea that the heart, our emotion, our mental emotional self is is linked together. So it's not like our our heart is our pumps blood and our brain thinks and has emotions. It's like that's all kind of one system of thought in traditional Chinese medicine. And it's also the way that we, uh, it's kind of the housing, if you want to think about it that way, for our belief systems and the way we perceive the world. And that has so much to do with our physiology, with our well, with our wellness, mm -hmm. with how our bodies operate, and even with the choices that we make, with the decisions that we make, behavioral change. Well, so, so, so much. So people are trying to make body changes on a body level, but we're not just body beings. Correct. We're multifaceted beings on many planes, mm -hmm. and and so the uh, the heart mind is going to play a humongo part in the change process, mm -hmm. um, whether or not we're addressing it. Because if we don't address it, we're going to be banging up against something we don't know what you know. But if we have it as a part of, mm -hmm. um, then we can create more profound transformation on the body level. Right. That's exactly the point. So if uh, we're trying to help someone change behavior to have a better uh, or healthier weight, let's say, or even better sleep or um, lower their blood sugar. Like we can be trying to help people have behavioral changes for that. And it might just seem like it's just not, they're not able to make the change. Like there's not able to do the thing to create the effect in the physiology. Then there's a block in the heart mind. And so there's a block with the way that likely the person is um, perceiving their themselves in the world and their belief systems about the world. And they're, you know, they're, they're, that's the one of the coolest things about doing somatic coaching work is mm -hmm. really helping people to understand exactly what those things, what those things are on a, um, on, on a really simple level and a really simple level, there's kind of like two primary kind of uh, perceptions that will massively drive someone's physiology. And it's either, do you have the perception that you're safe in the world or do you have a perception that you're threatened in the world or you're not safe in the world? That's right. Like just that yeah. alone, that alone will have massive driving implications for your choices, behavior, and certainly in your physiology itself. And that's that right there is the missing piece that a lot of wellness professionals, once they start to learn this work, they're like, that was the thing that I was missing because I'm trying to get the body on board and the person is telling me that they want the change and their body is suffering or their, their mental emotional state is suffering and they know that the body can help and they want it. They, they told me so. Mm -hmm. And yet we still can't do it. And, and why not? What's going on? It's like that, that safety piece is really 
the missing piece so often for, for folks. Um, the body is trying to protect us. The subconscious mind is trying to protect us. And when we recognize that, we can see that the person who says they want the change, it's not that they're lying and it's not that they don't want it. And it's not that they're being resistant or bad or wrong or unmotivated or mm -hmm. unproductive or lazy or all of these things mm -hmm. that we use to judge ourselves. Something is protecting them. And I have a great example for you. Let's do it. Um, I don't, I, I'm not somebody that people would find to coach on weight loss that I would not hang that on a shingle mm -hmm. and uh, say like, I'm a weight loss coach. And a number of my clients have been interested in having a more healthy weight. Okay. Every time, every time mm -hmm. I have coached somebody who wanted to have a healthier weight, whatever that meant to them, there was, uh, and by the way, they're all women. <clears throat> there was some kind of a belief structure, belief system that if they were a healthier weight, um, then it would not be safe mm -hmm. for some mm -hmm. reason. And just to, to point out kind of a general what that might be for, for people like that, and it was exactly what was going on with my clients, it's, uh, it's not always safe to be uh, an attractive, sexy woman mm -hmm. in our society because that can invite potential threat. And when mm -hmm. our, when my client was able to see and identify that mental emotional construct that was going on for them, and then to be able to tie in some evidence and past experience to say that actually was true for me, mm. then they were able to make profound transformation in their lives. And by the way, they didn't care as much about the, the weight or the number or any of that anymore. They really wanted to be like a healthy, mm -hmm. mental, emotionally well individual who loves themselves and feel safe in their skin. Perfect example. It's like a really perfect example. And, um, and you know, it's interesting from a, a, a coaching perspective, if you don't, one other thing that can be helpful to know. So a lot of times when you're looking at it from the outside, so I, I can't speak for all of your, all of your clients experiences, Ani, but my guess is that at least for some of them, from an external viewpoint, if you were to look at their life, you think that they're safe. They, they have a safe household. They have plenty of money, or, you know, to to to, to mm -hmm. feed themselves. They have a safe car. They have a safe partner job. Often. They have a safe partner. Mm -hmm. And so, from the outside, you could be like, "This doesn't make sense." Doesn't like make sense. they're safe, and this is actually even more distressing for the person. Yeah, for, it's because not they're rational. like they don't in their body they don't feel safe, uh -huh, and but they look around and say, but, but I, like, I look at it, I look at it and it looks like I should feel safe. And so then they say, what's wrong with me? So there's a, there's a mismatch in, in like a disintegrity, if you will, between what's showing up on the outside and what's showing up in the inside. Yeah. And that's something that, um, if you can help someone work through that, you can bring things into alignment yeah. like you were doing with your clients yeah. and then create really, really powerful changes for people. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know that, then it's just like a hamster wheel and people, uh, clients will just jump from one wellness professional to the next because they're not getting the result that they want. They have no idea why. So one of, one of yeah. the ways that wellness professionals can help, again, help their people get better results or to recognize that there's an additional level above just this body level. Mm -hmm. There's the level of perception and belief that is also massively impacting um, the person's decisions and choices in their physiology. And one of those beliefs is, are they, do I have a, a, a perception or a belief that I'm safe in, in this world? A deep, like an, on embodied, a core, an embodied belief. belief. Yeah. That I'm safe in this world or that I'm not safe in this world. 100%. That can be driving a lot, a yeah. lot of stuff. Absolutely. You know, the other thing that comes up is sometimes people just pop right into that like purpose driven vision mm -hmm. that they want for themselves. And that cr also can create a real disconnect. Mm. <clears throat> like I see myself as the athlete I want to be or as the healthy person. Like I can see it. Like I know part of my purpose here is to be more well and I just can't get there. Yeah. There's, it, it seems like this massive chasm between, and I think it, it, it almost like tends to shrivel, like if we can't feed it. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons that people 
like ping pong back and forth, back and forth, because it's a, it's in our acorn. It's in, it's in our, it is in our purpose, but we can't reach it through mm -hmm. the level of the body. And then we get all junked up in, with all of the mental, emotional stuff that not a lot of practitioners, let's face it, can really help people navigate. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can't really feed that spiritual purpose. Sure. And <clears throat> if you had a methodology to help someone really tap into their purpose state, because again, we look at purpose as a state, not a doing, but a being. When you can help someone tap into what they understand, what their purpose state is, then that really can drive that. It's amazing how much that drives decision making to be able to start making decisions based on your purpose, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, and it can really clarify a lot of the muddiness that happens in the emotional perceptual mm -hmm. space. Yeah. So just as an example for myself, so my my purpose is to um, influence people to be able to step into the highest aspect of themselves and embody the natural laws. I mean, that's like one of, that's my purpose here on the planet. And when I get up in the morning and I think about that purpose, that's going to help me decide what to eat for breakfast. It's going to help me decide what exercise to do. It's going to help me decide what meditation or mindfulness practices to do. It's going to help me decide what work to do. It's going to help me decide everything if I'm basing everything based on knowing what my purpose is. Yeah, and it's going to help you decide whether or not you're going to have that glass of wine that the scientist exactly. said. Because by the way, the scientist told us that it was good, and now they're telling us that it was bad. And like, what do we believe we say to ourselves? Mm -hmm. Well, if we can align with our purpose, we're always going to do the thing that is most on purpose with us. Exactly. Including having the glass of wine when it's important for all the multitude of reasons why having a glass of wine might be important. Mm -hmm. I don't really drink a lot, but when I go to your parents, your dad offers me a glass of wine. I don't have a glass of wine because I like wine. Sorry, Josh, if you're listening to this, it's not really that. It's because <laughs> I love you, Josh. <laughs> it's because I have such a respect for your dad and he loves wine, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all of this. Everything that we're talking about, about wellness has this multifaceted mm -hmm. uh, meanings yeah. associated with it. And there are many reasons why. So we can really align ourselves with the exercise that really, gosh, Brian, I was just thinking about a client who was like, I want to exercise and I just can't get myself to do it. You know, how many times have we heard that? Mm -hmm. I want to fill in the blank. And I just can't get myself to do it. And I was like, well, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying to run or I'm trying to swim. Or I'm trying to say, what do you want to do? Like, what feels good to you? What do you like? Well, I like to dance. Well, are you dancing? Well, no, I didn't know that counted. <laughs> But that's what you're yeah, talking right, yeah, about, exactly. right? About aligning with your purpose yeah. and being mm -hmm. able to make the decisions. Like I got a, I got an email from her and she's like, I'm dancing and I feel great. Um, Cause that's what it's about. We're going to find out that the numbers that they said, you know, didn't matter or the, we'll talk about cupcakes and muffins here oh, yeah. for just a, a second, right? Or that the, um, what's the <laughs> body mass index? Like that, that was created by, we'll find out that that those things, those numbers that were attaching were created by people who didn't, it wasn't really meant to, to do those. Like right, we're yeah. constantly finding those things out. Um, cupcakes, cupcakes and muffins. And well, you'll find out that if you eat a cupcake and you call it a muffin, that your body metabolizes it differently. Yeah. Way, true, right? true like, story. There's some good <clears throat> research around that. Uh, yeah. If you eat, <laughs> it's crazy, right? But it just, you eat a cupcake, yeah. you call it a muffin and you'll metabolize yeah. it in a more healthy way yeah. than if you call it a cupcake. Right. So we have, there's so much mystery. I think mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to say, right? There's so much mystery. And we could weight ourselves down in all of the things and then get really disappointed when it changes. Mm -hmm. Or we could find and live in our purpose and make decisions in alignment with our purpose, mm -hmm. make it simpler, enjoy our lives, and do things that are really aligned. Yeah. So if we just backing up for a second, um, with that said, I think I agree with you that the purpose, if we can really fully embody and live in our purpose, that is the that's the prow of the ship that's going to bring us whatever we want and towards whatever we want in our lives. And if we're really exhausted, if we're really tired, if we're really malnourished, it's going to be really hard to do that. Yeah, certainly. So we have to kind of go back. And, and the reason I'm, I have it kind of in this down Stacked. and up I'm talking about is because in my mind, I'm seeing this traditional Chinese medicine model of what we call the, the lower energy center being the body energy center, the middle being the heart mind and the upper being the 
uh, the Spirit or Shen Center. So that's what I'm seeing in my mind when I talk about the up and the down. Sure. I'm not putting value judgments well, on these. It's not just about <clears throat> value. It's also about the fact that it's not like we get there and then we've arrived to Nirvana Correct. and then it's yep. over forever. You need to like, integrate the whole absolutely. system again and again and again. Again and again. So in order to move move into working productively with beliefs and perceptions, we have got to have a some minimum amount of vitality in the body in order to do that. And how do we get vitality in the body? We get it by getting enough sleep. We get it by eating um, food that's vital enough to energize us. We did. We get it by getting some exercise and we get it by doing, you know, some mindfulness practices, somatic practices, somatic practices like yep. those types of things, like core centering. That's how we elevate. Core centering is brilliant for that. Brings us up into this getting a a level of vitality that then someone can use to reach further into changing beliefs and perceptions. Absolutely. It's just like your car. If you have no gas in the gas tank, you are not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. yep. You got to put some gas in the gas tank and then you can go somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's just like that. Just like that. And by the way, if there's no gas in the gas tank, we're not like, what is wrong with this car? I never should have bought this car, the car, the car. No, we're like, oh, I got to get some gas. Mm -hmm. But we do that to ourselves. When there's not enough gas in our own gas tank, yeah. what's wrong with me? me yeah. I'm broken. I can never do anything. No, go get some gas in your gas tank. Yeah. That's it. If we're going to follow this metaphor, I think like the beliefs and the perceptions are like the windshield wipers. Oh, really? Yeah. Because if you're in the car and you're driving and you can't see out the wind, can't see out the windshield, like <laughs> yeah. well, how do you know where you're going? Yeah. And so it, it so when you cleanse your perceptions, <laughs> yeah. you can actually see where you're going. When yeah, you clear good. up all the emotional junk and emotional stagnation and chaos, and that's like the rain just pounding on your window. That's perfect. And people ask us all the time, like, how do I know what I should do? And it's like being in the car with a gunky windshield yeah. and not being able to see, like we're supposed to tell you, you're supposed to use the wipers, people. <laughs> Turn the windshield Then you'll on. know. Yeah. So well, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So wellness professionals can learn to help people clean up their windshield wipers by, by cleaning up and clearing up their basic perceptual blocks and challenges. And then once you have a clear windshield, finding your purpose isn't that hard. Because you can see it's Because you right can there. see it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you knew where your purpose, even if you knew your purpose, <laughs> if your windshield's dirty with mud and you, it, it, you can't, see it. you can't go anywhere. Yeah. So that's the, again, if we just kind of think about that hierarchy, this is why like this conversation around wellness professionals and, and wellness is so important. Like, yes, like it's, uh, and it's the way work the, the body and this then is where we're work going. the mental emotions, work yeah. the purpose. And then once the purpose is turned on, it helps everything else move in the direction that um, is the most uh, productive and rewarding for the person as an individual. 100%. I have one more thing to say. Go for it. So uh, I do hear quite a bit. People are like, but I've got all these certifications in physical fitness, in yoga, in diet, in whatever it is for wellness professionals, mm -hmm. whatever like the kind of modalities are. Like they have all of this. And by the way, a lot of people also have a lot of medical expenses. Mm -hmm trying to figure out all of the right, like mm -hmm. what was going on there. And then they figure it out and then they invest in the coaching certification. Right. And they're like face palming the fact that they're like, now I got to learn somatics. Yeah, dude, because it's like, <laughs> we're constantly evolving. We're constantly growing. We're constantly learning. And that's how it goes is that you can, you can, there's more. There's more to the story. But I do. I do want to say too that our students, uh, especially our wellness professional students, do have a sigh of relief with our programs because they do tell us all the time this mm. was the missing piece mm. I was looking mm. for. I knew there was a missing piece, and I didn't want to invest more money and more time into learning something else. And thank God I did because it was the it was the missing piece. <laughs> so if you feel like there's a missing piece, don't stop looking because you know finding that. <laughs> is so great. You might just have to turn on your windshield wipers. You might have to. But that's it's it, right? right in front of you. It was right there all the time. Yeah. 100%. Well, <laughs> We're going to have to like get a sub business in auto repair. No, I, I don't I, know. I'm not sure. That sounds like a really <laughs> bad idea. <laughs> all right. We'll stick with people. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us again for uh, this week's Somatic Coaching Academy podcast. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye.
thank you for listening to this episode. We hope that this conversation will help you improve your practice and change the way you think about your work, your clients, and yourself. Continue your exploration of trauma-sensitive somatic coaching by listening to more podcast episodes at somaticcoachingacademy.com. You could be the trusted guide that people turn to to help them with their most challenging situations and to reach their most precious goals. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.